Hey, Walter Sorrels back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, an introduction to knife forging. Today we'll be doing an introduction to making forged knives. We'll be forging my interpretation of a very simple Scandinavian style knife called a Lapin Liuku, which I believe translates in from Finnish as large knife. It's basically an older brother to the better known Puko knife, which is a little bit smaller. Anyway, as you'll see, there's more to making a forged knife than just whaling away with a hammer. You've got to heat treat it, you've got to make a handle, there's a whole wide range of stuff, so that's what we're going to be doing today, taking that knife from a piece of metal all the way to a finished product. So my assumption here is that you don't have tons of fancy tools at your disposal, so I'll use a wide variety of approaches uh, doing a lot of the work with very simple tools, but I'll also be using some of the more common uh, knife making tools like the belt grinder. More on that later. So let's get the show on the road and I'll address some of the questions that beginners will want answered as we go. Scandinavian knives are typically thin, so I'm going to be using a fairly thin piece of high carbon steel known as 1095. The first job in forging is to put a point on this rectangular hunk of steel. So I'll heat it until it glows bright orange and start whaling on it. I'll begin by holding the steel totally flat on the anvil and hitting down into the corner of the steel at roughly a 45 degree angle. If I whack straight down on the steel, what happens is that the corners fold over and the steel begins to cave in on itself, causing something that's referred to as fish mouth. If you keep hammering, the two pieces of steel will get smashed together forming what's known as a cold shut, meaning basically a break in the steel. This steel is so thin that it wants to roll up on you, so funnily enough, it's actually a little harder doing this here than it would be on a thicker piece of steel. So I want to work nice and hot, putting the steel back into the forge as soon as it stops moving easily under the hammer. While I'm bashing away, let's talk about the anvil and the forge. Unfortunately, anvils are one of the few things that it's difficult to cheap out on. With the success of forged in fire, Used anvils have gotten harder to find and prices have risen. A knife making anvil should have a hardened steel face and ideally should weigh well over 100 pounds. The bigger the better. This one is a 130 pounder. People have been known to use chunks of railroad tracks sunk in a bucket of concrete however, so don't let anybody tell you that these rules are hard and fast. You have to start somewhere. Most knife makers use propane forges. As you can see from the pathetic look of this forge, you can make them at home. I made this one decades ago, knowing zero about what I was doing and having hardly any tools at all. And it still works just fine. Okay, so now we've got a point on this thing. Next, we'll be forging the bevels. Normally, this takes a fair amount of work. In this case, however, we're using really thin steel and putting a very short bevel on it that's characteristic of Scandinavian knives, so it won't take a ton of time or muscle to get it done. That's why I chose this blade for an introductory video on forging. In order to forge bevels, that's the knifey, slopey part of the knife, I want the steel flat on the anvil. The slope will be imparted initially by canting the hammer face slightly. I'll be moving the blade and hammering on this side of the anvil, giving my hammer room to come off the blade without bashing up the face of the anvil. On the second heat, I'll flip it and I'll do the same thing on the other side, but with a difference. First, why flip it over at all? Well, if I just work one side, the edge won't be centered in the middle of the blade. Now, in order to keep the bevel on side one flush, I'll be tilting the blade slightly. I've gone to the other side of the anvil and crossed my hands, but I'm basically doing the exact same thing I did on the first side. While I'm finishing the bevel, let's talk tongs. 
The normal tongs used by knife makers are called box jaw tongs. They're really adapted for holding rectangular stock. I made these super crude ones about 15 years ago and they're finally about to die on me. Another alternative are these split jaw tongs. There are a million kinds of tongs that are useful for smiths, but 90% of my blade forging is done with box jaws. Basically, you want tongs with jaws that fit whatever you're making so it doesn't squirm around in your hand. If the tongs don't fit the work, it's really difficult to handle your steel. Okay, so after a couple more heats and flip overs, I've got the bevels complete. Scandinavian knives are typically made from thin stock, as I said before, with extremely short bevels, which are ground to a zero point with no secondary or micro bevel at the edge. This makes them extremely sharp and means that we only need to forge a very short bevel. At the end, I always heat the blade to a dull red and very, very gently straighten everything out and make sure all the lines are where I want them. So now we'll flip the blade around and forge the tang. This will be done by canting the steel on the edge of the anvil and then whacking the steel with the corner of the hammer. If you do this a lot, you'll probably get a guillotine or a spring hardy tool, which will do a cleaner job of bashing this little corner, but there's no need for that now. You can do it all with a hammer. Once I've established that corner of the tang, I'll just whack away tapering the tang away from the blade. Hammering steel is like punching a pillow. When you bash it in one direction, it just expands in another, so you'll need to work both the flats and the edges to keep the tang from getting unnecessarily thick. Once that's accomplished, I'll do what's known as normalizing, heating the blade to around 1600 Fahrenheit, which reduces the grain size and relieves some of the stresses built up during forging. I'm using a magnet to roughly gauge the heat. Steel becomes non-magnetic at 1425 degrees Fahrenheit or so, so I'll heat it to that point, then a bit beyond. Hey guys, let me jump in here to put in a plug for our sponsor, Combat Abrasives. Combat not only makes all the belts that I used on this video, including their excellent shredder ceramic belts, but they also produce Rogue Epoxy, an epoxy specially formulated for knife makers. Rogue's available in both slow and fast curing versions, so you can get moving quickly on your project or give yourself lots of working time to assemble something complicated. You'll see me using both of them on today's project. If you'd like to help the channel and save some money too, click the link to Combat Abrasives in the description to get a 15% discount on your order. After repeating normalization three times, it's time to start shaping the blade. I'll do a little compare and contrast as we go, using hand methods along with power tools. The point I'll be making is that you can make almost anything using simple hand tools. The second point is that it's way easier to do most things with power tools. I'm aiming for a rustic as forged finish for most of the knife, so all I'll be doing here is working the bevels. I'll do bevel 1 with a file and bevel 2 with a belt grinder so you can see the way those work. The scale that forms on the surface of the steel is actually harder than hardened steel itself, so you don't want to wreck a brand new file. I'm just using this crappy old file that broke on me a while back. I don't care if I ruin it. I start by blasting my way through the scale using the corner of the file. Once I've mostly broken through that tenacious layer, I'll use the flat of the file.
What I'm doing is maintaining a perfectly constant angle following the one already established during forging. If this was a perfectly flat piece of steel, I could establish a perfect looking grind line with a file. But the unevenness of the steel formed in forging leads me to a grind line that waggles along with the contours of the blade. Side two leads me to this, the king of the knife maker's shop, the belt grinder. If you get serious about knife making, you'll end up with a 2x72 inch belt grinder similar to this one. The 2x72 inch grinder is absolutely the foundational tool of the serious knife maker's shop. But even a cheapo 1x42 inch grinder from Harbor Freight will be faster than using files, marginally. I'm using a 40 grit ceramic belt here. The cheapest belts are aluminum oxide abrasives, but ceramics like these combat shredders, while a bit more expensive, last so much longer that I almost never use aluminum oxide anymore, at least not for heavy stock removal like this. I grind the edge down to about 15 thousandths of an inch thick, maybe half the thickness of a dime. Millennials will not know what a dime is, but us old people who used to buy things with this stuff called money will recall them fondly. I'll also work the tang, again using the file on one side and the belt grinder on the other. Both work equally well. The belt grinder, however, is roughly five times faster. I'm forming a neat little shelf at the juncture between the tang and the blade using this little gizmo called a filing guide. You can buy them from knife making suppliers or you can make them yourself as I did this one. By filing right down flush to the file guide, I'm able to assure that the little shelves on each side of the tang will mate dead perfectly with the bolster, which I'm going to use to form the front face of the handle. By the way, if you're interested in doing this project yourself, check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash waltersorrels. Any supporters of the channel at any level can pick up the plans to this and other projects with all the dimensions and materials and whatnot right there on the page. Now it's time for heat treating where we cause soft steel to become much harder. We'll heat the blade in the forge, this time to about 1500 degrees, again using the magnet along with a couple decades of experience to estimate the temperature. I'll be quenching the blade into oil, which will convert the steel from a structure called austenite, which is very soft, into a structure called martensite. At that point it will turn from a knife-shaped object into an actual knife. I'm using an engineered quenching oil here called Parks Number no. 50, but you can do this using motor oil or peanut oil or transmission fluid or just any number of other oils. I recommend warm peanut oil over anything that came out of your crankcase, but they'll all work to some degree or other. After it's cooled, I'll verify that the quench did its job by gently scratching the knife with this file. It should skate over the steel and not bite in. If it bites into the steel, then the knife didn't harden. Everything worked out fine though, so next it's into the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. This is a specialized heat treating oven, but you can use a kitchen oven and it'll work just fine. Now I'll finalize the bevels. Want to go the handwork route? Because the blade has been hardened, filing is not an option. So if you want to do something like this entirely by hand, you have to go back to medieval techniques. This is a Japanese water stone. They come in a variety of grades and grit sizes, the most aggressive of which remove metal a lot faster than you might think. But not that fast. 
Japanese water stones, as the name indicates, are worked wet, like so. Japanese swords are still polished this way to this day. Under competent hands, they're capable of amazingly precise and beautiful work. But we're not really aiming to do that here. Just trying to show how it works. And here's the other, much easier way. Belt grinder, baby. Again, I'll start with a 40 grit ceramic belt, then move to 60 grit ceramic, then finally to 120 grit and 220 grit aluminum oxide belts. We have to go nice and slow at the end. Grinding a Scandi or Zero grind is a fantastic way of burning the edge and ruining the temper, so easy does it. Let's turn to the handle. I'm going to show this knife with a brass bolster. Now, if you want to, you can skip the brass and avoid a whole lot of heartache and work. But I'm going to show it with the bolster anyway, and you can do it the way you want. I'll use a piece of quarter-inch brass stock, piercing it to fit precisely to the knife's tang. This part's only fun if you really love slow, painstaking, slow, 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 painstaking work. That said, the idea is to use a combination of drilling, sawing, filing, and swearing to produce a perfect little slot that fits the knife exactly. Patience is a must. Swearing's optional, but recommended. There's just no good way to do this, but here's one approach. After laying out where I want the slot, I drill a series of holes well under the width of the slot. I'm using a number 36 drill, which is about a tenth of an inch wide to start this slot, which is an eighth of an inch wide. Using a jeweler's saw, I saw out the webs between the holes. Then, using files, many of them specially ground for the task, I'll painfully and tediously swear my way through to a hole that neatly fits the tang. Some of these files have been thinned, and some have safe edges ground in so that the file only cuts in one dimension. This will help you cut in sharp corners and avoid wandering off the straight path. In between this shot and this shot lies about two hours of painstaking work and a lot of very, very finicky, careful try fitting. After making these by hand about 10 times, sane people go out and buy a mill, which will cut this slot in about 5 minutes. Now we're on to the woodwork. Birch is the traditional wood, but I'll be using a hunk of cherry burl because it's a lot cooler looking. As we've shown, hand tools work just fine. I have dozens of hand saws. This one's designed specifically to cut as slowly as possible. Now I'm not one of those people who think that you get extra points in heaven for spending your life doing tedious manual labor. So if you got a bandsaw like I do, you have my blessing to use it. I guarantee you after I turn the camera off, that's exactly what I did. Now I'll flatten it out on this piece of 60 grit sandpaper to get rid of the saw marks and make it dead flat so it fits together without ugly gaps. I'll use a ruler to check for flatness as I go. Another approach is to use a disc grinder. Believe it or not, when using 60 grit sandpaper and a relatively soft wood like I've got here, the hand method really isn't that much slower than the disc grinder. And I find that doing it by hand actually results in a flatter piece of material. Next I trim a thin little piece of contrasting wood, alder in this case, to fit around the tang. There are a dozen different ways to make hidden tang handles, but this one to me is the easiest. You just draw around the tang, then saw it out. Make sure that you leave just a little extra room at the end, because you may need to trim or grind the face in order to make it perfectly flat against the bolster. In this project, I'll actually be using two different types of epoxy, one quick setting and one slower. Typically, slower epoxies are a little bit stronger, but this isn't the main justification. Sometimes you want a job finished quickly, 
so you can get on with the work. And other times, and this typically happens when fitting together complex multi-part handles, you'll need more working time to fiddle around and assemble and clamp and clean squeeze out and all the different operations that are required and you don't want everything freezing up on you before you get it done. So it's handy to keep both types on hand. Right here, very little fiddling is involved, so I'll use the quick setting type. Once that's set, I'll insert the tang. Now, I could have done all this at one throw, but there's less chance of goofing up by doing it in separate operations. This time, I'll use the slow setting epoxy, which will leave me time to make sure that the bolster's situated correctly and that everything fits together properly. As it turns out, this went very smoothly and efficiently, but better safe than sorry. Finally, after that cures, I'll drill an eighth inch hole and epoxy in a brass cross pin. Again, could have done all this at one throw, but especially with the pin, I prefer to do that in a second operation. Now it's time to shape the handle. The hand method, first trim the excess with a saw, then it's on to files and rasps. I won't go into too much depth about file and rasp technique, but basically I start out by filing facets, and then eventually I start doing more sweeping motions, smoothing the facets into curves. A rasp will really go fast, almost as fast as a belt grinder. So you don't want to get too aggressive and overshoot. As with everything else in this project, hand tools work just fine. But as you might expect, I prefer the old knife maker's friend, the belt grinder. Again, I'll start with 40 grit ceramic belts and work my way up to progressively finer belts as I get closer to the final shape. The Lapin Leukus that I've seen are very simple utility items. They tend to swell dramatically toward the butt, but I'll do it a little less aggressively. After all, this is my design and I can do it how I want. Once I've got the shape established, I'll finish up with hand sanding, smoothing out all the hard edges, making it feel nice and comfortable in the hand. A little tongue oil. A quick buff. And there we have it. I really can't say how authentically Scandinavian it is, but I was aiming for the spirit of the knife and I hope we've kind of hit the mark on that. Now I couldn't show you every aspect of blade forging here, but hopefully this gave you a chance to peel back some of the layers to get a little deeper than they do on forged in fire or whatever, and get a feel for how you could go about forging a knife for yourself. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!